We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello and welcome to the Dutch DP recap. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was one hell of a race to come back from the summer break. That that had so much stuff happen and we have so much to talk about and I, I think it you know it was definitely worth worth the the 5 a.m wake up call that I had for the the pre-race show yeah it was it was the wet one that's for sure and super mm-hmm. super fun to come back to uh, I was very nervous that it would just be clean easy sweep by Red Bull but there was a little bit of drama here and there we had some DNFs so lots to lots to talk about today before we get into our recap um, of the race though Catherine where are you podcasting from it looks familiar to our prediction podcast from earlier this week yeah so I just had a lot going on this week so I decided not to try to find another spot in my apartment to um try to record from. Um not that I come in completely in love with this spot. Um but this does feature not that she's showing on camera but my cat is right next to me on the couch so we've got a special guest for us. Um but Emily, you're in a slightly somewhat more familiar place from a couple episodes ago. Where where are you podcasting from? Yes, I am in my my office slash spaceship room. Um, so I have this like weird room off of my bedroom that's all like doors, basically all uh, glass sliding doors, and then there's this weird glass ish roof. Uh, so it kind of looks like I'm in a spaceship. Per everybody I take calls with at work when I'm in this room, so we call it the spaceship room. But yes, I uh, it was too loud on this street, so. I needed to podcast from somewhere else today. So we're trying out some different areas. So, And if you can see all of the buildings behind me, I live, I have like a big courtyard in the back of my apartment and it's surrounded by the buildings on the block. So it looks like I live in a strange, awkward building, but it's really just my courtyard. So it's fine. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Uh, but yeah. I don't know about you, Catherine. I loved Zanvoord. We were talking in our DMs, and I'm very excited to go. I want to go next year. It looked like a party before the race started. They had a DJ out on um, the pit lane or the the grid where all the cars were lining up before they did the national anthem. It was crazy. The crowd was amazing one of the better crowds I think I've seen in the last few races even when it was pouring down rain so much fun um I I'm convinced I we need to go to Zanvoort next year that's my my take (laughs) I mean not that I disagree with you but I think that every time we watch one of the European races we're like okay so we have to go to the risk this race because I think we had the exact same conversation earlier this summer for Silverstone which like we need to go to Silverstone, but we also do need to go to Zambort. Um, well, obviously and, we have to go to Silverstone yeah. because it's Silverstone. Like, well, yeah. you can't not go to Silverstone. But of the, you know, outlying not OG races, I think the Je- the Dutch GP is definitely one uh, that I now I'm going to start looking forward to and would like to go to. And I think it's interesting, too, how they brought this one back because this one is pretty new on its second leg, I would say. It's only been back for a few years now. So I think they're doing a really good job with it, bringing a lot of fun to the track for all the fans. All weekend long, it looked like everyone was having a great time. And the track is beautiful. The landscape's beautiful. I'm not super looking forward to being poured down (laughs) in rain and being stuck in a rainstorm or multiple cells of a rainstorm. Um, some for, some foreshadowing to our, our actual race recap, but the race was exciting. That made it exciting for the driving was not bored at all. I think there was maybe like a five minute period where I was like, okay, well, this is it. And then someone got on the radio and it's like, expect rain in a few minutes. And I was like, all right, we're back, baby. Let's do it. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty exciting. I like to watch it at least. It was a good first race back from the summer break. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was watching the the post race show, and I believe it was Alex Albon who who said that um, this you know they haven't had a completely dry weekend 
in months. Like we we have not had a, a race weekend that has been completely dry, you know, whether there's been rain on race day or in, you know, quality or in one of the practice sessions. We've had rain basically every week we've had a race since I don't know, before Monaco, I think is what, what they were saying, which is just, it's crazy when you think about it. And it's crazy as I'm sitting here living in the middle of a desert and I haven't seen rain in, you know, forever. Um, I didn't even but, think about that. Yeah. I didn't either until he brought it up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think about the no rain weekends. Now that you say it, I'm like, oh yeah, there's rain, there's rain, there's rain, there's rain. We had more rain. Definitely had rain. Uh, Yeah. That's, that's a, and I'm sure the drivers are well aware of when they have rain or not. So, and for us just, you know, spectating, it's, it's exciting to see rain in the forecast because that makes it more interesting and the strategy has to change. There's more pitting based on if the track is dry or wet um, or flooded, we could get a red flag. Um, But yeah, no, it's definitely interesting. It, it it makes for a non-boring race weekend. Let's just say that. Yeah, there, there are some drivers that, you know, you don't necessarily expect to see doing well who do well because it's raining. Um, and one of those drivers, and we'll talk about him a lot more later, is Logan Sargent, has done a lot better when it's been rainier and driving on those inters than, than he does on, on slicks, which is, is really interesting to see. And Lance Stroll is notoriously one of those drivers who is good in, um, in the wet, um, wasn't so good in the wet today but but is is typically you know you have those drivers that are on the grid that are notoriously better um when when it gets rainy and that you know was one of the things that makes formula one exciting because it gives you an opportunity to see something different and see someone else doing something exciting yeah exactly so it's fun to switch it up a little bit like when there's some variety in uh in the standings so but like where there was no variety (laughs) Some, not a lot, but some. A little bit. <sighs> not no, if you want, un- though. No, unfortunately, Max won his ninth consecutive race, which, you know, ties Sebastian Vettel's record for most consecutive wins, which is really, really annoying. But again, like I said on our um, podcast on Thursday for our projections, if he doesn't win every single race from now on, I'm going to be so disappointed. Like, that's my expectation from him moving forward. So, yeah. I mean, as a Red Bull fan, I'm really happy that he won his ninth consecutive race. I think it's a great thing to happen. Um, Did I also really enjoy, you know, Alonso going after him in that seven-lap sprint, and he actually had to, like... He had to work for it, but um, like I also mentioned on on our in our predictions podcast, you know, last year at Zandvoort, it wasn't a guaranteed win either. He he had to he had to work hard to remain P one, um, and this was basically just another another edition of that. And he is also as as you mentioned, Emily, this is the the second you know iteration of the Dutch Grand Prix, and Max is the only winner of this new era of the Dutch Grand Prix, which is is pretty pretty fun yeah and I mean I don't love why he won again because I'm not a Red Bull fan but as someone who doesn't love Checo it was really fun to watch him undercut Checo and then Checo come on the team radio and be like what happened did Max undercut him undercut us and his engineer have to be like yes Max pitted and undercut and then there's just silence on the radio like no response nothing Maybe there was, but we didn't get it on the on the telecast. But I personally love this weird rivalry between Checo and Max because we know Max is gonna win, but Checo's like still trying. Which, as every anybody should, especially your teammate. But it's just funny how he's like the last one at the party to understand what's going on. Um, but yeah, seeing him undercut Checo as soon as he pitted, I knew I'm like they're gonna undercut Checo. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then I knew it was over from there. So, 
I don't know. Yeah, it was, and and I mean, it was, it, it was, and then you know, Checo did a little oopsie, um, and he ended up getting a uh, five second penalty for speeding in the pit lane, um, which is unfortunate because it knocked him out of the podium, and we'll talk about who ended up on the podium instead later. Um, but what was interesting was this wasn't like Max coming on the radio and saying I'm gonna undercut Checo like this. This this was like above both of their pay grades. Um, it was totally a like helmet christian sort of decision probably this is our assumption um but there there was no way in hell this race was going to end with a red bull driver that wasn't max verstappen um in in front if red bull had anything to say about that just with you know they obviously they weren't going to stop him from getting the record um obviously max has just been on this ridiculous run um and there there was just there was just no chance of them letting checo stay in p1 if max was going to be right behind him no the comparison is ferrari favoring charles red bull favors max like, even regardless of what's going on, they'll always favor him, I feel like. But he's their golden child, and which is totally fine. He's also an amazing, amazing driver. So yeah. I don't think it was for the records. I don't, I mean, a little bit, yes, but I think a lot of it was just to win the race. I think yeah. the one record that they're really trying to shoot for is earliest world champion like deciding factor. So I think that's yeah, the one that, that they're would, going for over anything else. Yeah, and that would be Singapore, um, which is uh, two races two away, races. which is absolutely insane um, that we are we are coming up on you know that that stretch of, of the season. We've got um, Monza next week, and then uh, two weeks after that, we're in Singapore. It's wild. I'm excited for Singapore and Tokyo, but I'm also not excited because of the time difference. Those are the two time races that really get me. I know, but it really gets me. It's 2 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. It's just so brutal. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, even, you know, last year with Suzuka and the, the weather delay, you know, the race didn't start for me until very late as well. And I'm one of those people who does go to bed early. But anyway, we'll talk about Suzuka and, uh, and we'll talk about Singapore when we get to Suzuka in Singapore. Um, but we can talk about um, Fernando Alonso broke another record today. Um, yes, he, he did. did. Yeah, he, so he finished P2. Um, and this is the first time he's finished P2 all season. Um, all of his other podium finishes have been P3. I can't remember off the top of my head the last time he did finish P2, but it's been a minute. Um, and the record that he broke was the longest interval between his first podium and his current podium, um, which now sits at over 7,000 days, um, which is really just kind of hilarious because like he's just like he's old we know he's old he in, in comparison that's just to showing the how just, old he's he old is. showing yeah. how old he is that's that's where he shows his age like he can still race with the best of them he can race with all of these young 20 year olds but that record shows his age and shows how long yeah. he's been in the sport <laughs> But no, we were talking in our prediction podcast about how these Aston Martin upgrades, we wanted them to kind of fix what were the upgrades that ended up being the downgrades from before the summer break. And it looks like it did because this is his first P2, as Kath had mentioned. And we also said that we wanted to see Fernando on the podium. We just didn't know what these upgrades were going to do. So it looked like they were really, really good for Fernando. Stroll struggled a bit so I think it's hard to tell how these upgrades came for Stroll did they do upgrades to both cars do you know I don't know but but also you know Fernando has been consistently beating Lance all season long he's had so. better pace than Lance yeah and I think Lance also struggled too with some of the the traffic and pitting and certain you know coming in for those inters and timing wise so We'll give Lance a pass this week, but let's see what he does in Monza with these upgrades. Yeah, speaking of, of pitting, one of the things that is, is kind of important to remember is that compared to the other, to most of the other pit lanes that we have on, on all these tracks on the, on the schedule, um, 
Zanvorts is a much shorter, narrower pit lane, so it is a lot harder to get a lot of cars through at once, which you saw at the beginning of the race when everyone was diving in after lap one for inters because it started raining immediately after lights out and then again when it started raining um a second time later on in the race um you know you had a lot of traffic and you know some drivers were able to you know avoid that but then you have other drivers and, and lance was one of them that just really kind of got would get tangled up in those situations and that's really that you know that's something that you can't exactly control because it's the weather yeah exactly but yeah and i didn't realize that they even have a different pit lane speed restriction at Zanvort too because of the narrow pit lane because yeah, it go, went from yeah. it goes from 80 to 60 yeah so I 60 thought that was really Zandvoort. interesting too that's like yeah. that's tough to slow down yeah well and I thought in my again getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here but Checo got a penalty for speeding in the pit lane I was like oh maybe they just never fixed the setting on his car which sounds so stupid because you think that they would do it and I was like maybe he just that was the simple error in why he was speeding in the pit lane but then it comes out that he's sped by like 0.6 kilometers per hour which is like yeah. absolutely nothing how do you even clock that like I no, it seemed ridiculous, but speeding is speeding. Yeah. We don't condone speeding it. Speeding is speeding. Hey, hey like yeah, Catherine we said, <laughs> got that too. Yeah, no. speeding is bad. Don't do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, he wasn't the only one to um, get nailed for speeding in the pit lane. Pierre Gasly also got nailed for speeding in the pit lane, but that was like in the first half of the race, and then so many other things happened um, between, you know, necessary pits and um, the red flag later on in the race um, that, you know, un unfortunately, Checo had seven laps to try to figure out something to do to, to get around that, whereas, you know, Gasly's was... Um, you know, really early on, and it allowed Gasly, who ended up being in P4 and basically spent most of the race in the top five, um, and then he inherited um, P3 when um, the uh, penalty was applied to Perez after the checkered flag, flipping their positions. Um, you know, I just remember both of us were like, how did Gasly get on a podium? Like, well, the entire happen? time, I love the kid. He's, he seems like a sweet guy, but I feel like I always forget about him, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Like, he's never this polarizing, you know, the public is annoyed with you, and he's never this polarizing, like, you're always in the media. He's kind of, to me, just floating in no man's land. I don't know. I never know where he ends up. I'm never like, where's Gasly? Where's Gasly? Yeah. And then today, I think that's why I was like, wait, what? Where is he? But, you know, good for him for getting on a podium. He did drive really, really well today. He defended Carlos a ton. Carlos yeah. was behind him. So Gasly did finish P4, but with the penalty from Checo, he ended up in P3. So between P4 and P5, Carlos and Gasly were fighting most of the race. And he defended Carlos really, really well. We all know how much I love Carlos. So for me to say that, you know, he really did do a good job defending. He earned it today, I think. So yeah, and, and I think Al Alpine really needed that like they, that morale boost because the last time they had really anything good happen for them was at Monaco when Acon finished um, on the podium at P3, and then ever since then it was just you know bad race here, bad race there, double DNF, another double DNF. Half their the management got fired, so you know this this was a really good thing for Alpine um, and get more more double points finishes like they expect. Um, especially just considering all the expectations that they have with their with their driver lineup, with everything going on around them. So it's I, I think it was it was really good for them, um, even if it's just really baffling because like we just didn't see that coming. But what we did see coming was Ferrari being a shit show, and boy yep. were they! They did not yeah. disappoint. I didn't get my double DNF and or double podium, but I got one DNF. And a fifth place. So I feel like I came out halfway between my prediction. Um, God, what a mess. I just... Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. They, they were... <sighs> like, for all that they, you know, came out not, you know, obviously a DNF is bad, but when you think about it, they were anonymous in the practices. Um, they somehow managed to qualify well 
in, I mean, in Q3 well. Um, but then when you, when you, like, really think about it, like, it just they did not look good but they somehow did decently and then somehow carlos managed a p5 finish um to salvage this you know mess of a weekend and you know we we all saw you know obviously if you watched the race you saw the first lap the the biggest thing that everyone was watching was uh leclerc pitted for inters and there were no tires in his pit box when he came in um because it happened so quickly and you know he you know it wasn't like he made that call and the team wasn't ready for it that was a a part that was part of the plan with you know the impending rain um but it just it it doesn't look good and then it you know just the way that they kind of you know they talk to their race engineers on the radio and the way that 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 always plays out it just always makes them look worse than they are it does and like going back to the pit for charles like yes he was coming in they didn't look ready they had to scramble for tires because it was lap one you know really mass chaos but then if you got to see the instant replay, someone goes to take off the front wing. It's like, what are you monkeys doing? It's just like a zoo in there. I swear, it's all just like mass chaos in the Ferrari pit right now. They don't know what's going on. And speaking of, you know, engineers on the radio, Carlos's engineer gets on at the end of the race and goes, all right, Carlos, keep it up. Four laps to go. And Carlos goes, no, I only have three laps to go. And it's it's just mind-blowing to see Hey, math this is radio. really hard. No, it's not that hard, Catherine. Like, <laughs> time zone math, I'll give it to you because that's difficult. But how many <laughs> laps you have left is not hard. I don't understand what's going on with Ferrari. Like I said... The break was either too short or too long, and I think we got a mix of some of that for all of these people, so it's still just a cluster. But yeah, yeah. So Charles DNF'd because, you know, he went over gravel, he had floor damage, his car just kept getting worse, so they pulled him. Carlos got P5. I don't know how, but he did. At this point, Carlos is getting points all on his own because it's no help from the strategist, no help from his engineers. His engineers doesn't even know how many laps he has left. So, Mm -hmm. you know, he's doing it all on his own. God bless him. But yeah. Oh, every single hard. He really does. And every single second they showed Ferrari on the screen, I was just like, Oh no, what now? What's going on? But. Yeah, you you know it's bad when when you cringe when you just we, even when you just he, see the little graphic that says like Leclerc radio, like you know it's never going to be good, which is just so unfortunate because Ferrari is just like supposed to be this historic team and historic program, and they're just not living up to their you know legacy at the moment, no. and no, and, really, and they really kept- haven't for a while. No, and they kept, like, flashing to Fred, too. And I'm just like, he's not going to do anything. Why are, we, why are we watching him? Let's watch the race. Might as well just watch Max cruising all by himself in the front because uh, I can't talk about Ferrari anymore. It's just going to make me more upset than I already am. But I'm really happy that well, I, I will. five. I will add, I was watching the, when I was watching the post-race show, they did talk to Fred, and they asked Fred about Monza, and, and they were just like, you know, the, the Tifosi have such high expectations, and Fred's just like, in that, that, like, deadpan French manner of his, is just like, why are you making me talk about this? I'm not, you know, not even to paraphrase, but he just looked very uncomfortable. And he's like, I have a couple of days before I need to think about Monza. Um, so I am just going to, we're just going to figure out what's going on. So hopefully they'll they'll figure out what's going on at Ferrari. I, I don't expect that they will, but, you know, we, we can only hope as this is his first season as uh, their, you know, team principal. Well, and Ferrari only has one race in Italy this year, because normally we have two, but Imola was canceled, indefinitely suspended because of horrible, horrible weather in that area. The whole entire track was washed out. The whole town was washed out. Um, So Imola was canceled, so they do only have one race in Italy this year. Ferrari's an Italian team, for those of you who don't know. Oh, But yeah, just one opportunity to disappoint the home team this year instead of two. There you go. Yeah, pretty much. 
man. And speaking another of disappointment, team. <laughs> I was going to say another <laughs> team was full of disappointment this this weekend. Oh, Mercedes! And that would be Mercedes. Yeah, they oh, they Mercedes. just they gambled at the beginning of the race, sticking. You know, Lewis was was very much out of position after a really bad qualifying that was compounded by Sonoda impeding um, Lewis in Q two. And I, I don't I don't think that you know. Had Lewis not been impeded, it still wouldn't. I, I still think it wouldn't have been a, a great qualifying session for him. Um, but they gambled by putting him on mediums because apparently Mercedes missed the weather report um, and left both of their drivers out way too long. Um, you've got George who's calling from P18, like, what the hell is going on, guys? I was forecasted to have a podium. Um, and, and, you know, he, you know, George was what? P, he was P4 after qualifying um so obviously that is something that you could naturally expect that he he would you know, he was he was p3 um so that's something that you would expect like he would remain on the podium but all of a sudden he he's driving in p18 and then he and lando who also just did not have a good race and just they they also you know mclaren also gambled and and did not do well with uh you know trying to navigate the weather um but you know lando and george they tangled up and george got damaged and he took a puncture to one of his tires the second time it was raining and so he was one of the other retirements and it's just it was a it was a bad day all around and Toto's not happy and when Toto's not happy no, no one's, one's happy. happy no I okay say what you want but George's radio call about I was supposed to get a podium and blah 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 made me think of Lewis because it's I feel like he that's something that he maybe would say or maybe would have said a few years ago of just being frustrated but George, just because you start in P3 does not mean that you're going to get P3. So that doesn't mean you're forecasted for a podium. Like, just take a beat, buddy. I also yeah. think it's really, really hard for teams to do strategy when the rain is very unpredictable. You have multiple cells. The timing is not guaranteed. It's weather, for goodness sake. So yeah. One of the, I think Lewis was saying, we can't stay out, we have to come in, and they're, they were saying, no, you just have to ride it out, you have to stay out there, just do it. So they're all taking their best guess, and someone's going to be right, someone's going to be wrong, some are going to be all in the middle. So I think Mercedes, and unfortunately McLaren as well, were two of the teams who just didn't quite get it right. And it's so hard with, with weather and the strategy, and I don't know, it's really hard. I feel bad yeah. for the strategists, honestly. They must have had a really hard weekend. Um, would not yeah. want to be well, there I mean, right now. One of the, the most important things is that, you know, they did not have a lot of running in dry weather. You know, all there there was rain all weekend long, and then, you know, a lot of this race was in the dry. There were just those big moments of, you know, all of a sudden it is raining, and it is raining hard. Um, and, you know, of of the few drivers who were able to, to ride out that weather, somehow, um, I think Alex Albon really managed it the best. And, you know, he, he was the one who was P4. Um, and he, you know, he really managed to, you know, hold on, you know, driving in that very very early torrential downpour on softs, um, which I don't know how he managed that. And then he also managed to, to maintain a, a top 10 uh, finish and score some points for Williams. And like, he had a, he had a great weekend. I'm going to like puff up his feathers again for like a third podcast in a row here. Albon is driving like a madman in that Williams. He went on sauce for I think 37 laps, which is insane. Not to mention through two bouts of weather. No one is driving like that. No one is driving as well as Albon right now. I think if he was in a stronger car than the Williams, he would be on podium after podium weekend, week out. But that's Absolutely. just me. No, That's no, no you're, you're absolutely right. He he took that one stint of 36 laps on one set of soft tires, whereas Lance Stroll, I think he pit four times in that same stretch um, from, you know, lap one to lap 36. So it's, you know, he is he is so good, and he's just really trying to make that Williams work. 
and some of of why he moved down the line was just by virtue of um you know he's that Williams is not always great um but this was a track that suited Williams well um Monza is also a track that suits Williams well so I expect to see um a similar performance hopefully it will be a little bit drier next week for Albon I know I was just gonna say as much as I love a crazy wet weekend I really hope we have some dry weather to just have some clean racing and it can still be a wild weekend we just need some you know clean racing I'd like a non um safety car restart here and there if we have one I hate rolling starts they're just not fun to me but yeah they're safe but they're not fun I know I know yeah, yeah, yeah. safety you, first you, you and Karoon, you wanted that, that standing start. I think we could have done a, sta- a standing start, honestly. I really think we could have today, but yeah, I digress. Anyways, speaking nope. of safety. We, yeah, this, this, was, this was tough. Mm-hmm. This, was, this one hurt. It really hurt my heart because I was so excited for Danny to come back and have a killer weekend. And, and then, then he broke he his went and broke his wrist in FP too. So, yeah. Honestly, I blame Oscar. <laughs> it's Oscar's well, fault. <laughs> I mean, Oscar crashed because I I mean, I I don't even remember what the cause of the crash was, but Oscar crashed um and while on a hot lap and Ricardo was right behind him, he was also on a hot lap and at that point Danny's options were crash into Oscar or crash into the wall um and he chose wall which is a nice thing to do I guess um but he didn't have time to take his hands off the wheel and uh that broke one of the metal carpels in his hand um which um as he said ow my hand um and yeah he he had to to bow out the rest of the weekend he had surgery it is a Sunday as we film this um he had surgery today in Barcelona um I believe he's being being treated by the same doctor who treated Lance Stroll um, when yep. he broke his hand prior to the season. Um, and the so for for a normal human being, um, normally going to a doctor who isn't, you know, a, a fitness and endurance athlete, um, it takes six weeks to recover from a, an injury like this. Um, so that would mean after Suzuka. Um, but it looks like he could be projected to be back until, you know, at Singapore. I think Singapore is a stretch. Um, but I also didn't think that Lance Stroll was going to be able to drive the car in Bahrain. So we, we really don't know when he's project going to be back, but they're, they're saying Singapore. Um, um, and I mean, it would be really great to, to get him back in the car, even though the person who drove for him, uh, Liam Lawson did have a good um decent debut um in in his first time in an f1 car in an f1 race yeah no liam did a really good job i mean he finished p13 he did have a big penalty for uh impeding but he didn't have a horrible race it was his first no, time driving was... on slicks this weekend because it's been in such horrible conditions. He's never taken an F1 car um, on slicks this weekend, but it was like the formation lap because he'd been on inters for uh, quali and FP3. So he took yeah. over for Danny in FP3. Or did he even have FP3? I think he, he jumped in he for drove, FP3, He right? drove in FP3. I slept through it because it was at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm not waking up for that. Um, too early. But he he did drive. I think it was still wet, and I think he was on inters. Um, and his his first time on on slicks was that formation lap, which is just wild. Um, and because going from slicks managed... to inters are it's a massive completely difference of different. tire. The car drives completely differently. So if you've never taken a lap on slicks, the car is going to feel like you you're driving it for the first time. So it's. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. He did actually finish in front of Yuki, which that's, I mean, he spent most of the race in very, very behind, but he managed to make up some ground. He did, you know, beat Yuki. So not a bad day for for the young rookie. Yeah. 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 
let's let's not talk about Haas. Let's just leave it at that. Um, oh, they they did they did not have it. They did not have a good weekend. Um, no. But yeah, Liam Lawson. He's currently he's he's the AlphaTauri and Red Bull reserve driver. He's currently second in the Japanese Super Formula Formula Series, which is basically like Asia's version of F one and is like the the pinnacle of Asian motorsport and single seater. Um, so he's like. He's a really good driver um, and, you know, was the the best option that AlphaTauri had of somebody to take a seat that has already been covered for for someone else, if you think about it. And um, while we expect to see Liam Lawson in Monza, that has not officially been confirmed yet, um, but we we shall see. I don't I, – I mean – it's not like Danny is coming back by this weekend, so and I don't no. think they would pick anybody over him. He beat Yuki. I think he's earned his seat for another race. I don't think they're going to be like, "Hey, Nick, you free this weekend?" Oh, they uh, they they are they already said that that wasn't even in consideration for when when Danny got hurt in the first place. No, I know. I'm just uh, making a joke. But, I'm but just oh no, 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 abs- <laughs> absolutely no. I I, I agree. I th- I think, and if if we want to put our little um conspiracy theory tinfoil hats on, um if um, if they really want to get rid of Checo for the 2024 season, they would give Danny Checo's second, the second Red Bull seat, and then have Lawson drive with Yuki in 2024 at AlphaTauri. Um, so that's that's the the tinfoil hat conspiracy thought based on the performance today and also based on the fact that all of a sudden, um, you know, Helmut Marco, Christian Horner are going back on what they said a few months ago, weeks ago about how Checo seat is safe for 2024. And now they're saying, this oh, is what well, I'm saying. You no, know. this is what I'm saying. I'm, I've, I'm, ca- I'm just, they're trying to get rid of him. They're trying to bounce him. Cause they're like, Hey, he's not as good as we thought. We need to get rid of him. How can we do it? They were trying to, you know, be neutral, but they're coming out swinging now. I think it's all a motivation tactic, but still. yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. So, so if if you want the the conspiracy, that is, I, I think that is the leading conspiracy of what's going to happen with Red Bull next year if Checo doesn't, you know, shape up and continue, you know, making podiums or getting anywhere near a podium. Speaking of our other big conspiracy theory which is <laughs> Logan Sargent's seat at Williams. Yep. He actually had a good weekend until Sunday. <laughs> Let's say that. Well, well also he, Saturday. Well, the well, lap yeah. after. I mean, okay, let's take let's run it back here for everybody. So yeah. Logan Sargent, our lone American driver who has not done well this season, I would say at all. It's at his rookie all. season, but still, we're going to say he's not done well at all because he really hasn't. He finally made it to Q3, which is the third round of qualifying. Hasn't made it. He's been in Q1. gotten. He's been out in Q1 almost every single weekend. I think he's made it to Q2 once or twice all season, yeah. and so he finally made a Q3, which is really exciting. He's the first American to do so since Michael Andretti in 1993, so it's been 30 years since we've even had an American in Q3. So super exciting. First hot lap, boom, goes into the barrier. <laughs> like like Logan ha- and has done so many times this season. Hits yeah. the barrier. So he ends up in Q2, or ends up qualifying P10, P10. Which is still better than he's done all season. Really excited for him. And then he, you know, immediately crashes and his race is over. So, yeah. It's the, fine. They they did say that it was a hydraulic issue. So it wasn't just like drive totally it wasn't totally driver error. Um there there was an issue with a car, but still like this this is the time where he needs to be showing that he can perform. And while I do think that it was good that he made Q3, I think it was also really bad that he crashed after making Q3 um, and that I he, he has not yet done enough to keep that seat. And you've got uh, Mick Shoemaker in um, in the back of the, the Mercedes garage, just, you know, he he's eagle-eyed waiting. He's waiting for that seat to open up. Yeah, and... I could tell something went wrong with the car watching him crash in the race because he was he was turning trying to make that car go and it was not doing anything and it wasn't like yeah. the fronts were 
were stuck. It looked like there was a, an issue with the car. And so I'm, it was good that it, the crash wasn't all his fault, that it was a hydraulic issue. However, he did crash in Q3. So he had two big crashes in probably 24 hours, let's say. Maybe I'm off of my hours a little bit there, but Give or take. That, does, that does get expensive for a team. And you have to remember Haas let Mick Schumacher go a few years ago because he kept crashing because the team just couldn't afford it anymore. So that is something for Williams to take into consideration. Yes, he's doing better by driving faster, getting into Q3, but he's also still causing a lot of damage, which is expensive. So yeah. Also, Mick Schumacher got let go last season. So it feels what? like two years no. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, no, stop. Yeah. See, this is what I say by years are hard for me. I swear. Like, last year, things that happened four years ago were last year, and things that happened... Like, I'll also be like, oh, yeah, like, last week, and someone will say, that was three months ago, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh, okay. So, ignore me. Thank you for fact-checking me there, Catherine. Oh, yeah, because yeah, this is no. his first... Yes. No, it's all coming back. Yes, because he was like, oh, last year, and this is his first year with Mercedes. Okay, yes. Yeah. It's coming yeah. back to me. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Where Speaking Where does the time of- go? <laughs> Yeah, no, speaking of Haas, while we don't want to talk about their performance today, we can talk about the fact that on Thursday, prior to the weekend, um, Haas did announce that they are going to retain Kevin Magnuson and Nico Hulkenberg for 2024. Um, This is probably the earliest that they've ever announced their next season's driver lineup. Um, And, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't think that's, you know, a smart idea. Like, they don't have great drivers, but, you know, Say what you will about, you know, Kevin or Nico. Like, who are you going to replace them with? You know, Haas is not going to um, gamble with rookie drivers again, especially not two rookie drivers. And, you know, Haas also knows that they have a car that's great on one lap, but struggles on Sunday. And that's not something that, you know, you know, K-Mag and the Hulk could only do so much. Yeah, I'm really excited to see these two come back next year. I think it's really smart of Haas. They are more seasoned drivers. They have not caused as much damage as the two rookie drivers that they had uh, last year. Last year. Two years ago. Two years two ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. Thank you. Years are hard. But yeah, and I think. Them having a strong car that can get them into Q3 for qualifying shows that the car, the race pace is there. They just can't keep it. So they do have a fast car. They have a good car, but they just need to figure out how they can transition those results from Saturday to Sunday. And I think maintaining two season drivers will help with that. Uh, just giving them feedback, understanding what's going on with the car. And I think with rookies, that might be really hard to start a whole nother rebuild. So they're not I'm excited to see it. them back. No, they won't do it. Yeah. Some other driver seat news. I know we came on here last week and talked about Joe Guanyu's seat at Alfa Romeo allegedly being confirmed, kind of. He's expected to resign, but they've also come out now saying that it's potentially in jeopardy because of the budget. This one troubles me, and I don't understand it. Again, I don't know the ins and outs of all of the budgeting of F1. Um, But Catherine and I were kind of talking about this earlier. It could potentially not be with salary and with damage. (laughs) So if you take a look at some of his past races, he has hit the barriers. He has had some big crashes. Nothing compared to Silverstone last year, but he has had some crashes he did crash today he caused the red flag half was him well, half but was also the weather. the weather was we'll really say it was bad. the weather the weather was really bad so but some of that might be a factor that they consider in keeping his seat around for next year is again the accumulation of costs that go into rebuilding the car from crashing lots of big words there um yeah. but, but it, it i personally sense. It does make sense, and I get that, but I don't know. I think he's doing so much better. Last year was his rookie year. He's doing so much better than last year, I think. He's always kind of there, and let's not, you know, shy away from saying Alfa Romeo doesn't have an amazing car, so he's doing the best he can with that car, but 
I think we need to give him another year. I think he's, I think he deserves it. I really like having him around track. I personally love that someone's finally challenging Lewis on the fashion sense. He's doing yeah. a great job of it. He he shows up to track on Thursdays and Fridays just looking awesome. So I'd like to see him around another year. Yeah, but. I I think that it would be you know it's another question of like you know who's gonna re- who would replace a Haas driver who's gonna replace him at at, at Alfa Romeo you know you know, who wants to drive that car? You know, Botas is driving in that car because he's just, like, living the dream and having fun um, and and there's zero pressure. So he just gets to race, even though he's racing for, like, P14, P15. Um, But, you know, who who would race with him? Um, And I I think that there there are not a lot of options of people who would be willing to to go in the car for, you know, less salary than what, you know, Zhou Guan Yu is getting. Yeah. I didn't even hear them talk about Botas once almost all weekend. I saw Botas before the national anthem was played when the DJ was out there and he was like having a great time and just like Mm -hmm. celebrating and dancing. And then that was the last I saw or heard of Botas for the entire race day. So he's, yeah. as much as I love that he's kind of riding into the sunset, it would be exciting to see a different driver. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this this He's is kind the guy of falling was, down in the rankings for me, but that's yeah, but I mean, this this was the guy who had been challenging Lewis for victories and had to be told by you know senior race engineer um, James Vowles. James Vowles. Um, we love James Vowles. Um, he had to, he, he was the guy who had you know who had to who had to be the bearer of bad news with with Botas and say you know you got to let Lewis through so Lewis can win the race, um, and 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 you know that's that's the guy and now he's just you know he's just chilling and driving a really mediocre race car um for for a team that that really makes very little impact on on the race which is just really kind of unfortunate because you'd like to see everyone do well but also you'd like to see them do well yeah exactly but overall it was an exciting race there was a red flag which I think they it was they made such such a good decision there. Uh, Zhou Guan Yu went into the barrier and it was a corner where there were several cars going off because of standing water and just weather in general. So with him in that barrier, there was potential for a really bad crash if another car went off. So they did have to call a red flag, got the car out of there, fixed the barrier, and then they continued on racing. But it took a lot longer than I thought it would. It was like 40 minutes. It was it was a really long red flag, um, which also, you know, they have to give a 10 minute warning. So that's obviously, you know, part part of, of what took so long. Um, but yeah, it was it was just very much like, so are we just going to watch another replay of things from an hour ago? Yeah. And, and and it was. Um, but what we did is we got a lot of fun insights this weekend from our favorite um, new F1 presenter, Bernie Collins, who we love and would love to see more of her on broadcasts. Um, and also we tagged her in one of our Instagram stories and she reshared it to her own Instagram story. And we just both freaked out about that because she we think she is awesome and very knowledgeable about the sport. Um, and we love seeing, you know, women in Formula One doing awesome awesome things um so we had to mention it on here that you know we we are just memorializing this on the pod um that she saw what we are doing and what we are sharing and she decided to share that with her audience as well which is pretty freaking cool yeah no she's awesome and i love the interview that she did with checo she used to be checo's strategist at racing point for force racing india point. force india and then she moved with him to to race Force India to Racing Point. To and Racing she Point. She ended up at Aston Martin. Um, and she had That's just right. um, retired last year, hello, Bishop, um, from Aston Martin and is now with Sky Sports. So much movement in this sport. But yeah, so she, it's not like she doesn't know anything. She used to be a strategist for one of these teams, specifically for Checo. So seeing her and Checo catch up was pretty cool to watch. It was a good interview. If you guys can catch it, watch the whole thing on your own. But no, she's really great it's really interesting to hear her take on things and hear it through a strategist mind versus just you know a spectator who you know is a armchair expert of the sport and would be like oh why are they going under this tire so hearing her perspective is always great always loved uh when she's on the broadcast during the weekend so yeah 
accent. So we will have our Monza predictions out this Thursday for you guys. We have races back to back, which is super, super exciting. So we will be in Italy this weekend. And I've been Emily. And I've been Catherine. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.